continue to show our jointness and our willingness to uh, bring highlight and uh, spotlight to our, our friends from Colorado Springs in this case. Colonel Jim Cook, who's the uh, chair of the Department of Philosophy at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, a career Air Force officer, now a permanent military professor. He will uh, facilitate this panel that will look at these three different types of uh, warfare ethics from places other than the United States. Jim, thank you. Thanks, Art. And thanks for putting a blockbuster panel at the end of the day. Uh, I don't think this is going to be anything but a pleasure. And I'm sorry that some of us did have to miss it. Um, because of the theme of the conference, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't address in some fashion uh, an issue that I think enjoys consensus, and that is that we have to know more about other countries and other cultures' opinions about just war. That's true regardless of the phase of war we're talking about, whether we're talking about planning and education, antebellum, whether we're talking about considerations ad bellum, whether we're uh, in bello execution phase or post bellum. Surely we'll do better in whatever, any of those activities if we know more about the ethics of war perceived through the cultures that are involved along with ours. That's, some of them will be enemies, some of them will be allies. Um, and this will help us, presumably, uh, sharpen our own thinking as well. So today we have this marvelous panel that can't offer a comprehensive portrait of all just war thinking, obviously, but we do have a nice subset. Um, we'll begin with Professor John Kelsey, who's Bristol Professor in Religion at Florida State University. He also serves there as Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Professor Kelsey received his PhD in Religious Studies from the University of Virginia in 1985, and since that time, the focus of his research and teaching has been Christian and Muslim political thought, especially with respect to judgments about war. His most recent book is Arguing the Just War in Islam, that was published by Harvard in 2007. And I'll just note personally that, uh, along with James Turner Johnson, uh, Professor Kelsey has done wonders for my own classes. Um, we often, for example, read a piece that came out in an edited volume of 2003 on uh, the epistle and declaration of Al-Qaeda members in 96 and 98. So I certainly owe him a personal debt of gratitude. And please, the okay. floor is yours. All right. Thanks very much. Um, everybody can hear me? Okay. So I understand uh, our charge in talking about these various traditions to give some sense of past, present, and future. And accordingly, this talk about Islam has three parts. Um, the first one you can think of as a historical development. Second one, the debate over Al-Qaeda and like-minded groups. And the third one, with respect to the future, you can call, we've seen this movie before. So, in the history of Islamic um, tradition, there are three primary forms of writing that uh, have had influence with respect to conceptions of war. Uh, there's the writing of philosophers like Al-Farabi, who talks about war in connection with the virtuous or ideal city. There are the mirrors of princes in which uh, court advisors like the famous Nizam al-Mulk set down their experiential wisdom in the hopes of educating wise statesmen. And then there are the rulings of uh, the learned, usually called jurists, um, who issue opinions on a variety of questions and provide guidance, uh, access to divine guidance according to the theory for believers who make inquiries. All of these have been important at various times in the history of Islam, but I think it is fair to say that the one that is most consistently important, and certainly the one that is the most revealing for us today, is the discourse of the jurists, and that's what I'm going to talk about. When jurists talked about war, they did so typically under the rubric of a collected set of judgments called Aham al-Jihad, uh, the judgments pertaining to armed struggle. This discourse developed, as did the rest of the juridical discourse, as the province of a particular class of people who were called ulama, uh, literally those in the know or the learned. 
Their associations and traditions eventually coalesced with the standard schools that are present even to this day in Sunni and Shi'i Islam. Now there are interesting distinctions in the question of sources used, particularly between the Sunni and the Shia. Uh, there are even more interesting, perhaps, distinctions in the preferred methods of interpretation between the schools. But for our purposes, what is interesting as a point of departure is a standard format. An inquirer comes to a scholar and poses a question. What's the right thing to do in circumstance X? And the scholar issues a fatwa, an opinion, in which the goal is to establish a fit between the textual precedents given in the Quran, in sound reports about the prophet's words and deeds, and in established precedents from prior generations of scholars. The scholar wants to establish a fit between those precedents and current circumstance in order to ascertain divine guidance. This is the process that most people describe as Islamic law or jurisprudence uh, for various reasons. Um, I prefer a term, uh, Sharia reasoning. It's the Sharia that they are aiming at, which is the path that leads to refreshment. It is the path for which, according to most of the texts, God has promised never to leave human beings without guidance so that they might follow it. Now the ulama exercised this process of Sharia reasoning and issued opinions on a wide range of questions. Some of these had to do with the use of military force. While the format of question and response uh, over repeated generations doesn't lend itself easily to a systematic presentation, it's nevertheless possible, I think, to uh, ascertain and describe a general consensus about legitimate war along the following lines. Legitimate war is first authorized by recognized public authorities, usually meaning the head of state for Sunni Muslims, for example, in the classical period, the caliph, or by his designated representative. Legitimate war is second associated with the cause of establishing maintaining or defending a geopolitical entity in which Islam is dominant. And then third, legitimate war is conducted in ways consistent with right intention. These ways include issuing a formal declaration to the enemy with alternatives offered, avoidance of direct killing of children, women, and others presumed to be non-combatants, and then limiting the use of weapons and tactics in ways that are proportionate to a particular military objective. These criteria constitute a broad outline of Aham al-Jihad. The ulama knew of exceptional cases. Let me just mention one, since it has import for talking about al-Qaeda. In cases where a foreign power invades Muslim territory, and the most obvious political authorities are unable or unwilling to respond, the ulama employed a kind of emergency argument. In this case, they said, ordinary procedures of command and control are suspended. Fighting becomes an individual responsibility. Now the terminology can be misleading. What the ulama meant historically was understood more along the following lines. Suppose that the provincial authorities in Damascus failed to mount a defense against intruders. In such a case, authorities more removed, say in Egypt or Iraq, should send help. The reasoning is thus not so radical as the terminology individual duty might suggest. That's an important piece of the puzzle associated with contemporary militancy, and so we're moving to the debate over al-Qaeda. As is well known, the February 1998 declaration signed by bin Laden, Zawahiri, and others refers to a unanimous opinion of ulama to the effect that when an enemy is occupying Muslim lands, 
fighting becomes an individual duty. On this basis, those who sign uh, give the opinion that fighting against Americans and their allies, civilians and soldiers, is the duty of any Muslim able to carry it out in any context where it's possible. So here, individual is taken quite literally, not so much as the historical ulama meant it. That text was associated with the World Islamic Front, which represented a union of Al-Qaeda, Islamic Jihad, and other groups. The authors were not the first to reason in this way. The Charter of Hamas used the language of individual duty along these same lines, as did the Testament of the Assassins of Sadat. Broadly speaking, in fact, this language and this take on individual duty is reflected in the rhetoric of Muslim resistance groups since the 19th century. Nevertheless, the argument outlined in 1998 has been the object of considerable Muslim criticism, especially since 2001. The arguments of the critics and the counter-arguments by bin Laden and others are very important for us to consider. Critics can be lined up in two broad groups. One I call Muslim advocates of democracy. The other are Muslim advocates of divine governance. That is, they share something of the goals of Al-Qaeda. Or alternatively, you could call them Muslims interested in the conduct of honorable jihad. The first group, Muslim advocates of democracy, aims at the issue of just cause in the sense of challenging the overarching goals of Al-Qaeda and related groups. The usual form of this criticism notes that bin Laden and others identify an Islamic state with governance by divine law in the strict sense, that is, all laws and policies uh, would be susceptible of a test. How straightforwardly can they be derived from the standard sources of Quran, the example of the prophet, and precedents set by established scholars. Uh, according to the Muslim Democrats, it's important that uh, Al-Qaeda sets this as the norm, along with the fact that Al-Qaeda spokespersons eschew constitutional democracy. Muslim advocates of democracy regard this as inconsistent with a contemporary application of Sharia reasoning. They argue that a po properly Islamic state uh, based on a reading of precedent and a fit with the current circumstance, should be a state consistent with notions of human rights. And this requires constitutional democracies in which Muslim and non-Muslim citizens, men and women alike, are treated equally. The critics then add that the failure of Al-Qaeda and like-minded groups to distinguish between civilians and soldiers is a strong violation of historic precedent, and they ask their co-religionists, do you really want groups that fail in war conduct to actually hold political power? The second line of criticism focuses on war conduct and brings in right authority in a particular way. So, those who are advocating fighting honorable jihad say that the failure to distinguish between civilian and military targets violates precedent going all the way back to the prophet. Further, the understanding of fighting as individual duty articulated in the 1998 fatwa and other texts, these critics say, is incorrect. If Muslims in Afghanistan are threatened, then established authorities in, say, Saudi Arabia should rally support. Further, these critics argue that issuing fatawa opinions is the job of established ulama, not of lay Muslims like bin Laden and al-Zawahiri. For these critics, the goal of a state ruled by divine law seems right. But their point is bin Laden and others are going the wrong way to get there. Now, the responses by bin Laden and others are very interesting.